One more, Jesus is talking to the Father in John 17, verse 4. I glorified you on the earth, having accomplished the work for which you have given me to do. Folks, in both of these cases, Paul and Jesus ended well to the glory of God. Now, it, and we understand that, that a good beginning should result in a good end, right? Amen. But, but, that, that word is common in Scripture. I hope you know that. But, how about Lot? He and Abraham's herdsmen were fussing about the land and the grazing land and all that stuff. And Abraham said, well, okay, we'll split then. You pick first. Well, what did Lot do? He picked a fertile valley there east of the Jordan and with lots of grass. And, and what else was there? Sodom and Gomorrah. He didn't finish well. What about Samson, a Nazarite to God? He, he dedicated his life to God so many ways, and yet he met Delilah. So he started good, but he did not finish well. King Saul. King Saul was tall, handsome, Scripture says, loved by the people, and he became so insanely jealous of David, and he was defeated by the Philistines. And then, of course, we know one of Paul's cohorts there in the New Testament, Demas. Demas was a great helper. And then Paul mentions one day in the Scripture, Demas has gone the way of the world. You see, starting good uh, does not always end well. And we have to know the psalmist wanted to end well. Here in, here in Psalm 119, ending well is the consequence of living well. Uh, so we, we keep that in mind as we go through that. Let me just say this, uh, what we're going to read this morning, those, those seven or eight verses. Things that this passage does say, it does say this. It says that God is the one who teaches us his way. It does say that once we learn his way, we are to observe it the rest of our lives. It does say understanding comes from him. It does say he makes us to obey him. He does say that walking in his path is not a chore but a delight. And it does say our heart is either inclined towards him or towards worldly things. It does say our eyes naturally look at vain or worthless things. It does say his word produces reverence for him. It does say his righteousness revives you and me. Now, at the same time, that's what the passage says. Here's some things the passage does not say. It does not say. It does not say that I can trust my own wisdom concerning God's word. It does not say if I obey him for a while, that's enough. I've said the prayer. I'm good. I'm on the way to heaven. It does not say that. It does not say that it is impossible to understand God's word. It does not say it's okay to obey him only when I feel like it or I agree with it. It does not say I'm naturally good and will automatically follow God's laws. It does not say my attitude towards God does not matter. It does not say I can follow both God's ways and the ways of the world. It does not say my eyes naturally seek out the things of God. It does not say saturating yourself in God's word will not result in reverential treatment of God. And it does not say I can be revived through any number of worldly methods. Folks, that's what the Scripture says, and that's what the Scripture does not say. Psalm 119, let's just read a few verses, starting with verse 33 through 35. It goes like this, Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes. 
and I shall observe it to the end. Give me understanding that I may observe your law and keep it with all my heart. Make me walk in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. Folks, we must praise for spiritual enlightenment so we can learn God's word and, and the way of his word. In other words, we must ask God to involve us in his, in his plan. See, it's not enough to read the Bible. It's not enough to outline the books, and it's not enough to get answers to questions you may have. It's not enough to discuss theology with your brother. We must come to understand the very character of God and his providence. Think, think about this with your parents, where, where this comes from, an example of that would be. We, we come as, as children of our parents, we come to understand their character of our parents. We come to understand their thoughts, their desires. We come to understand what pleases them. Well, folks, that's exactly what needs to happen with the Lord. We must get to know God better to discern his desires for our lives. It's written clearly. We have complete revelation of the Lord and his will in scripture. We don't need anything else. It's there. But we need to own that in our lives. We must bring that character of God into our lives so that we can. And that's what the, that's what the psalmist is trying to say. This teach me must be balanced with give me understanding. Both must lead to obedience to sin. You know, just think about this when you think about that. We don't have to pray for God to show us how to sin, do we? No. We do that pretty naturally, don't we? But we have to pray for God to teach me about sin and to give me understanding about sin. This psalm, is, he prays for understanding and wisdom. It, you know, it's one thing to have knowledge in this world. It's another to have wisdom and understanding. Now, if you like me and some other people, you know, you may not have either one of them. But I, it's, it's one thing to have the knowledge, though. So we know, or I know, you know probably too, people that have amazing knowledge, but they have no idea how to translate that to life. I had a call the other day from an old work associate from, I don't know, a long, many years ago. Does not know the Lord. He didn't know the Lord then, still doesn't know the Lord. And his words, first words to me, I see you're still alive. And he, he has amazing knowledge of even scripture itself. But he has no idea how to translate it to life. And he's the guy that I always felt like that the only person I've ever met that I thought had a demon. And... Uh, no, 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 this guy's another guy. He's worse. I, I ran across some bad people in life, I guess. But, folks, this is, when you don't have know how, you can have all the knowledge in the world. If you don't know how to apply it to your life and, and apply, this, apply this book to your life, then we're whistling Dixie. We, ha we have to know that. We have to understand that. That's why he said, give me understanding of your word. Uh, I, you know, where there is wisdom and understanding, that's where wisdom and understanding comes in. Let, let me let me just, you remember the time when, when parents tell their children they cannot do something? What's their first response? Why? And what's the next response the parent normally does? Because I said so is right. You know what? Uh, God is not a because I said so God. See, his laws are not silly. They're not arbitrary. Every one of them, there's a reason behind God's law. And, you know, so we pray to God to teach us his statutes, his laws. See, God is looking for consistency in our lives along the way of living this life. We must be consistent in following him. Now, Verses 36 and 37. Incline my heart to your testimonies and not to dishonest gain. 
Turn away my eyes from looking at vanity and revive me in your ways. Many people, instead of owning possessions, are owned by possessions. You know people like that? Yep. I mean, Jesus said, you remember, where, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. That's a, that's, that's a truism. It, it literally is. If, if you treasure material good, that's where your heart's going to be. And if your heart delights in God's commandments, that's where your heart will be. You remember the Apostle Paul said this, I have learned to be content whatever the situation. I, I've not achieved that level yet. I'm not content in every situation. But the Apostle Paul said it's possible to be content in all situations. Folks, I, this, is, this is interesting here that, that we must come to that. Because contentment does not come naturally. Uh, it, it just does not. We must learn it. We must find freedom in Christ to do what he wants us to do and to live the life he wants us to live. And then, then we find freedom in Christ. Let me ask you this. It, you know, it, it, the scripture said, do not focus on vain or worthless things. Vain, vanity is worthless thing. Now, ask yourself, how much time do you spend doing worthless things during the week? I, 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 don't want to, I don't want anybody to answer that. But how much time, just think about how much time you spend doing worthless things. Now, doing worthless things doesn't mean you can't take a break at work or at home, sit down and rest, take a nap. It's good for the soul. But what it means is when you're supposed to be doing something productive and you're not, that may be doing worthless things. See, the psalmist is talking about our eyes here when we see that. When the psalmist says, and my, my friend Hal Pettigrew, when I talk to him, he still asks me this. He's still mentoring me from thousands of miles away. Paul, what are you reading now? So whenever I talk to him, I'll be sure I'm reading something. <laughs> because he's generally going to ask that question. What are you reading? What are you, what are you watching? What are you looking at? And it just makes me think again and to do what I'm supposed to be doing. Well, worthless things. How much time do you spend online on Facebook doing this here? I'm sure that many of you don't do that at all. But you know what the national average is per day? Someone, the national average is 33 minutes thumbing through Facebook. Now, you say 33 minutes. That's not much. <laughs> now, I don't know. Somebody did the math. I didn't do this math. But you'll have to check that math. 33 minutes a day in a natural lifetime is six years and eight months that we did worthless things like scanning Facebook. Remember that Hebrew idiom, the, your eyes and your ears are windows of the soul. So that's what we understand. I mean, it's so easy to get trapped in that vicious cycle and do that. Instead of picking up God's word and reading it. In verses 38 and 39. Establish your word to your servant as that which produces reverence for you. Turn away my reproach which I dread. For your ordinances are good. What does it mean for his word to be established in you? In your mind, what does that mean? For his word to be established in you. Hmm? What he says we should do. Yes, you must own that, shouldn't you, Barbara? Uh, all right. Yeah, it. Uh, you know, sometimes with with God's word in us, we need to be reminded we're on the right road. 
or maybe we're, we're on the wrong road. And God, when God is abiding in you, he will remind you of that. It's sometimes it's good to see that we're still on the right path, that we're following what God wants us to do. You remember when Gabriel met Mary and told her what was going to be? You remember what she said? Profound statement. As you have said, let it be in my life. Folks, if we could just say that occasionally, Lord, let it be in my life as you want it to be. Sometimes we don't, we don't want to look that far because we might decide that that's not what we wanted to do. You see, Satan is a liar. Scripture says he's the father of lies. You know, Satan, I guess the reason I know something, I know something about this guy. And he says this, oh, you're doing good. Paul, you're doing good. Don't worry about it. I'm okay. You're okay. That's exactly what Satan will tell you in this life. Now, just don't believe him. Believe God in this world to come. See, fear of the Lord is, is the fear that conquers all fear. Fear being respect, reverence, awe of God. And the psalmist was not afraid of his enemies, God, but he's fearful of disgracing the Lord and, and bringing dishonor on God's name. The psalmist actually is praying for victory here. He says this, I don't want to break your rules, for they are good, but I still do. He said, don't let me be ruled. You, you know, what is this? Uh, he, the psalmist is asking to be, help you turn from his evil ways and being victorious in you. In verse 39, he said, what is this reproach that is spoken of? Well, it's the shame and disgrace or disapproval of the Lord in our lives. Now, I don't know if you've ever experienced that or not. I have the disapproval of the Lord in my life. And he reminds me of that. And he should. And then we go home and try to confess and, and, and be right with God again. You see, one of the problems is we understand, that, and it, it's the way of the world that we're taught in this world today that God can't help us as long as we're dabbling in sin. We think, well, it's okay. I mean, our walk must be consistent in the Lord, guys. When we think about that, you say, well, yeah, I, I, I gossip a little bit. But everyone does that, right? Or, oh, I get angry at times. Yeah, I get angry and throw a fit, but... So I messed up. I'm, human. I'm only human, right? This is what we think in these verses when we read these things. This is what man does relative to what God is expecting of us. Now, in verse 40, it says this. Behold, I long for your precepts or your laws or your commandments. Revive me through your righteousness. Folks, when we invited Christ to be our life, he imputed his righteousness into us. See, the point being is to hold on to the Lord's law, hold on to the Lord's instructions, and, and we, we can approach his throne room with boldness, guys, and knowing he loves us and he desires a relationship with us. And it's hard to understand sometimes why God loves us. It is for me. You see, to have a deeper longing for the things of God is evidence of a maturing believer. When you long for the things of God in your life. See, the psalmist longed for the day when God's salvation would be revealed. Amen. And in the meantime, the psalmist was satisfied with the living word of God. The living word of God is described in scripture as honey, as bread, as milk as solid food, all of those things that are good for you and I. Let, let, me just, let me just close with this thought. Folks, our lives are nothing without God. I hope we understand that at some point in our lives. We're really nothing without God in our lives. So much of what we value in life will not matter much in the end. 
You think about someone that's on their deathbed. They don't have but just moments left. That person won't wish we had more of this or that. That person won't wish we, we had a little more money or we had a little more cars or something like that. We might wish that we love God more. We might wish we'd focused on our loved ones more. And we might wish we'd shared our faith more. We might wish we prayed more. So folks, keep it in mind. I'm not saying it's going to happen today, but it may. And you just remember that, guys, if what's important in life it is what we're about in life, loving our neighbor as ourselves, loving God with all our heart, mind, and soul. Let me just as a suggestion, and I'll close with this. Maybe every morning as we wake, you might say to yourself, Lord, pour yourself into me. Live through me. Keep me safe this day. And a, and, a, and, a, and a statement here that I've heard my mother pray so many times, and it, it just still inspires me when I hear it. She said, Lord, she says, Lord, make me strong where I'm weak. Mother recognized her weakness, and she asked God to make her strong every day of the world. Ask God to help you delight in life with your whole heart. Because you are all the hope I have. Folks, I hope you understand that our Father in heaven is the only hope we have in this world. So hang on to it. Treasure it. Reach for it. Search for it in our lives. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and we'll be dismissed. Our Father, we just, we love you. We Thank you. We confess those times when we don't follow you. Lord, may be you be honored through our lives. May you have bring the glory. Be all for the that, that we would give you all the glory and whatever comes with it. It's nothing we do, but it's what you did. And Lord, we thank you for that. Lord, I just want to pray uh, for Danny and Faye too, and. Uh, Lord, that you might just supply their every need right now, heal their bodies, bring them back to us. Lord, that you might uh, work uh, a work in them that would bring glory and honor to you also. Lord, we thank you for this day, and we ask God that uh, you bless the remainder of this day, and we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Folks, let me tell you something. Danny and, pray for Danny and Faye. Uh, I hope you understand how important Danny and Faye are to us. I hope you understand how much work they do for the silver set. I mean, it's not an easy job putting up with you old people. Uh, and, and they... And, and Drenda can tell you this. Yeah, you want know, you know some details? Talk to Drenda. Because they did it for a good number of years. Folks, they, they, they worked their hearts out serving this silver set. And we need to pray for them. We need to thank God for them. So do that this day. Thank you, folks, for being here.